Usually a boss fight is a triumphant affair and the only tears you'll be crying are happy ones or because you forgot to blink for the entire confrontation. But not all boss fights grant us that sweet satisfaction. Sometimes a showdown with a major enemy can be downright devastating, hitting you in the feels harder than 1,000 Mufasa deaths. These tragic boss battles left us feeling utterly heartbroken. Please enjoy, if you can, and beware spoilers along the way for the following games. And also for the Lion King spoiler just now. Undertale is about as emotional a game as it's possible to be, bearing in mind one of the main characters is a disco dancing quiz show robot. Yeah, Undertale is weird. You play as a lost human child, befriending all manner of wacky residents of the mysterious underground as you head east in your effort to get home and few of those characters will win your heart quite so effectively as Sans, a chilled out hoodie wearing skeleton who loves bad puns and incidental trombone. How is a skeleton playing that with no lips though? Not tibia pedant or anything. Hit it Sans! Trouble is, there are several ways to play Undertale, and if you're determined to see everything the game has to offer, at some point you're going to have to do what's known as a genocide run, in which you brutally murder all the kindly creatures inhabiting the world, even Toriel here, whose greatest crime is wanting to adopt and care for you. Oof. But no boss fight will fill you with quite as much despair and self-doubt as the one with poor old Sans. For one thing, by this point you'll have realised that Sans is a much more complicated character than his skeleton puns and chill fashion choices suggest. Unlike almost every other character, he's aware that he's part of a game, and as the battle against him gets underway, his dialogue reveals that he's done this plenty of times already, and by golly, he's kinda tired of it. Before long you'll realise that Sans's role in Undertale is kind of to try and keep the world safe from you. It's a testament to the melancholy quality of his battle dialogue that even though Sans' attacks are overwhelmingly strong and varied, you'll never shake the feeling that, unlike you, he's doing the right thing. And should you survive long enough to exhaust this peacekeeping skeleton, his death is appropriately heartbreaking. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Sans. <laughs> Still, had to do it. It was the only way to find out what happens in the bad ending. I mean, except reading the wiki or looking it up on YouTube. The information is fairly widely available, now that I think about it. Captain Blaskovitz. Still fighting after all these years. I remember your friend. I savor his memory. Do you remember him? If the Terminator films taught us anything, it's that fighting robots is a pretty guilt-free experience. Or well, that in the Spanish for see you later. But what if a robot was imbued with the spirit of a person, or, more accurately, the brain of an actual person that you know? This is the exact predicament that BJ Blazkowicz finds himself in in Wolfenstein The New Order. At the start of the game, BJ was forced by diabolical Nazis to choose between two of his friends, adorable Labrador puppy in human form, Wyatt, or double hard Scots bastard, Fergus. The unlucky one is mad scienced by Death's Head and turned into a prototype robot-human hybrid and given the charming nickname Machine Man by BJ's Nazi arch nemesis. Machine Man, clear the room! 
Sorry, not charming, what's the other one? Horrifying. So, when you come up against this Nazi bot towards the end of the game, you know that inside is one of your friends, who is only there because of you and the choice you made at the start of the game. So, it's with a heavy heart that you chuck a bunch of Tesla grenades at your involuntarily cyborged mate, who, when you finally take them down, gives you a right guilt trip about it. Oh man. Well, at least now that he's pacified, we can work on finding a cure for being a Nazi robot, right, guys? Oh. Okay. See? You can depend on me. You see? This thing is a lot more reliable than any person. Than people? Resident Evil is a series full of clever puzzles and stupid people. So, when you first meet Steve Burnside in Resident Evil Code Veronica, you can kind of forgive him for mistaking you for one of the many zombies and shooting a whole ton of bullets at you. Wait, wait, don't shoot! Who are you? Huh? You're not a zombie. And you're not a very good shot, fortunately. But even if Steve is super rude and dismissive of Claire to start with, the two do become good friends over the course of the game, almost taking it in turns to save each other throughout their adventure. Yeah, Steve, Steve, I think, I think you got it. Unfortunately for these two friends, later in the game, Steve ends up injected with the T-Veronica virus, which, well, does this. Claire! Help me! Claire! <laughs> yes, Steve was turned from mildly annoying friend to mutant horror, and you really didn't want to make Claire hurt a single hair on his gross head, even though Steve happily chases you down a spooky corridor as he tries to slice you like luncheon meat. But sweet relief comes when Claire is grabbed by one of the many weird tentacles belonging to Big Bad Alexia, and he suddenly has a change of heart. <laughs> Yes, Steve pulls through and overcomes the virus, regaining control of his body and sparing us from having to murder him. Sadly, it didn't save us from more of Steve's voice acting, as he has one last thing to say before he pops his clogs. I'm glad that I met you. I... I love you. Claire. Okay, I, I know this is sad and all, but her name is just Claire, not... Claire. I mean, you know, if you love a least scared name, right? Oh, he's dead. It's always a terrible thing when you have to kill a dog in a video game. Like when those wolves were attacking my horse in Red Dead Redemption 2 and I was left with no choice but to kill and skin them. Tell that to my legendary wolfskin chaps. But few video game doggos have such an esteemed place in our hearts as Sif, the great grey wolf in Dark Souls. This canine, encountered in a moonlit graveyard, is absolutely massive and incredibly fluffy, which are already two of the best things a dog can be. Plus it looks pretty excited to play a game of fetch with that sword. At least that's what we assume the sword is for. Yep, in actual fact, Sif wants very badly to fight you. And even more heartbreakingly, you have to kill Sif in order to get any further in the game. Oh. 
but as so often happens with Dark Souls, this situation only gets sadder the more you read up on it. Lore aficionados will discover that Sif was once the companion of Knight Artorius, and accompanied him on a mission to fight the spread of the sinister abyss. Artorius didn't make it out, but in a last heroic move used his shield to save Sif. Now Sif, a good dog to the end, guards his master's grave, which is exactly where you've blundered into. And to get some mission critical loot from Artorius's grave, you've got to go through his guard dog. We're so sorry, Sif! We didn't even get to make him into chaps. <laughs> and they would be really big chaps. All that's left for you to take is my life, by your own hand. One must die, and one must live. No victory, no defeat. The survivor will carry on the fight. It is our destiny. The one who survives will inherit the title of boss. And the one who inherits the title of boss will face an existence of endless battle. I'll give you 10 minutes. The famously confusing Metal Gear series is full of gripping boss battles, and a character called The Boss, who is not to be confused with Big Boss, or Boss Baby. That's something else entirely. Look, I read 300 pages of wiki, pretty sure I got it. Part ignorance is bliss, frankly, because the more you understand about the plot of Metal Gear Solid 3, Snake Eater, the more heartbreaking its final confrontation becomes. The boss serves as your enemy throughout the game, despite the fact that she was mentor and mother figure to Naked Snake, the playable character for this 1960s set spy thriller. Snake's on a mission to foil a superweapon and assassinate his mentor. Despite having ample opportunity to stop you in your tracks, the boss clearly feels the tug of that old bond and doesn't kill Snake when she gets the chance, instead opting for the traditional motherly punishment of having a horse stamp on his hands. If we meet again, I'll kill you. Cheers, Mum. Made me the man I am today. Of course, it all has to end in a final confrontation, one in which you learn that the facts of the boss's defection are a lot more complicated than they seemed at first. I was pregnant at the time. The sorrow was the father. I gave birth on the field of battle. A beautiful baby boy. But my child was snatched away from me by the philosophers. And then it's finally time to kill the woman who mentored you, which frankly sucks. And then Mother Nature makes its own feelings known by turning all the flowers where she falls red, and the boss's horse whinnies in dismay at your savage actions. Yeah, no sympathy for you, Dob in the Knuckle Smasher. You stay away from Solid Snake's hands. Actually, it's Naked Snake, aka Big Boss. Solid Snake is a clone of Big Boss. A clone of Big Boss? So he is Boss Baby. Ugh. Imagine you've got a tiny bug on you. Gross, right? Now imagine that bug is trying to climb up to your weak spot and stab you to death. Nightmare fuel, right? Well, that's how every Colossus in Shadow of the Colossus feels, you monster. Indeed, this game is jam-packed with boss fights that make you feel super guilty, as these great creatures crash to the ground devoid of life. But one that might leave you more guilt-ridden than the others is the fourth, Phaedra, mainly because of how easy it is to trick this poor creature. A great horse-like colossus, Phaedra is unfortunate enough to live near a set of ancient underground tunnels. And while she has formidably powerful legs that could easily crush you like a naked snake hand, as Agro found out here, She's also not the smartest of the Colossi. So when you scrabble into the nearby stone bunker to avoid her powerful defensive stomps, she stands over the entrance you went through, trying to peer inside and catch you on the way out, despite there being four other entrances. It's the same tactic I used when that squirrel got into the crawl space under my house. It didn't work that time either. Just used the back door. He's my landlord now. 
But if only Phaedra had the same fate. Instead, her target, you, can sneak up behind her, or worse, leap onto the climbable rock formations dangling from either side of her head. And the meanest bit is that she's blissfully unaware that you've latched on until you're right on her face. Cue her freaking out as you scrabble up to her weak spots and stab them multiple times until she falls to the ground so gracefully she could be in an all-horse production of Swan Lake, leaving you with the horrible feeling that you shouldn't have murdered that creature who was just defending itself and wanted to be left alone. you'll feel better after fighting Celosia, the tiny colossus who you scare off a cliff with fire in order to expose its weak spot. Did I say better? I meant the other one. What's the worse? Yeah, worse. You'll feel worse. All squads have their disagreements, the Fellowship when Boromir tried to take the ring from Frodo, or Andy when he ate those donuts I was saving and I forgave him and never gave it a second thought. But no best friend spat is quite so intense as the one you'll endure in cooperative game A Way Out, in which you control either recently incarcerated Vincent or longtime criminal Leo, depending on how you feel about sideburns. Stay the hell away from me, okay? Vincent and Leo soon realise that with their powers combined, breaking out of the big house is a cinch, and they head off on a teamwork-infused adventure to get revenge on Harvey, a crime boss who both Vincent and Leo have ample reason to despise. Along the way, you and your real-world co-op partner, who can be either in your living room or online, will have to learn the subtle art of compromise. You'll be forced at several moments to settle on one character's plan, like right here on this bridge, with the game stopping you progressing until both players agree on a strategy. Which should be any minute now, because it's been 12 hours and last time they cracked in just 10. Whenever you're ready, Vincent. Fact is though, by the end of the game you'll have developed a real bond with both Vincent and Leo, lovable rogues that they are. Which is why it hurts so bad when it turns out that Vincent is an undercover cop and has been playing Leo for a sideburned fool the whole time. Good job, Vincent. What follows is a climactic final boss fight against your friend, where only one person can come out alive. I see you, Vincent. You can't hide from me. Despite the fact that you'll probably try, there's no way to put aside your squabbles and talk it through. Not even when you finally get face to face with your co-op pal turned rival. Vincent and Leo are just too hot-headed to find a non-violent solution, and heartbreakingly, it's up to you to lay the smack down on your best buddy, with each punch triggering an emotionally charged flashback that reminds you how much they both have to live for. It all ends with a button-mashing race to get a gun and seal a sad victory for your player. No, Vincent! Okay, I admit it. Your plan on the bridge was better. I should have said so at the time. And now there's no more time. I mean, you could have just told me now. We've been playing together this whole time. Get out of here, donut thief. Don't forget I saved your ass. Twice. I don't know about that saving my ass part, but I'll give you this. It did help out. A little bit. So, those were some of the boss battles that just made us feel really mean. Like, why are we doing this? That's all I play games to be the good guy. I, I'm not a mean, mean person. The poor little boss. I feel bad for it. 
Sorry, if you can think of any others, <clears throat> get, get it together, Ellen, uh, then pop them down in the comments down below. And uh, don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed the video. And if you want to see some more videos, uh, we've got loads of them. There's one up here from us. Uh, is uh, times that you play games so much that you kind of see them everywhere in real life. And it's just like amazing what it does to your brain. It's fantastic. And then also, if you just want to be angry, here are all the times that we were just like table flipping because screw this game, man. And uh, don't forget to subscribe if you enjoyed.